There is nothing more disappointing than seeing a supposed doctor standing up in front of thousands of people or millions of people when it's on YouTube and spreading dangerous misinformation like this. It's so wrong. It's so wrong. I'm David Rams. Welcome back to another video. Today's video is going to be a reaction or you could call it a response video to the very famous and popular Islamic leader, Dr. Zakir Naik. As I said, Dr. Zakir is extremely popular. He has around 2.3 million subscribers on YouTube and even has his own TV station, Peace TV. He's been at the center of a lot of controversies and his TV station is actually banned in Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, and the UK. But that's not what we're gonna talk about today. Today, I'm gonna focus on a very specific video he put out about vegetarianism and Islam. The video is actually titled, Why do Muslims have non-vegetarian food? Can a person be a vegetarian and yet be a Muslim? Full disclosure before we jump into this video and the reaction, I have edited the original video for two reasons. One, to cut out any gaps and spaces like breathing, coughing, things like that, to keep it smooth and keep the information flowing in a nice way. Two, because he does talk a lot about scriptures, Hindu scriptures, Islamic scriptures, even the Bible, and we're not here for that today. I'm more interested in what he has to say based on science and based on logic, not what he has to say based on faith. So I've cut those parts out as well. All right, all that being said, let's jump into the reaction and let's see what Dr. Sakir has to say. My question is regarding non-vegetarian foods. It is allowed in Islam. Animals are living beings. So don't you think that it is uh, violence? And my second question is that, is it compulsory in Islam to have non-veg food? And can a pure vegetarian person can follow Islam? Well, first of all, I mean, wow, what a compassionate man. What a really good question. And I don't know about you, but I, I can I can feel like really good vibes coming from this guy. It's a genuine question coming from a good place, from a good heart. And I can also tell you that from my time that I spent in India, I spent around 12 months living in India in total. This is reflective of most Indian people that I met. I don't know if this is just my experience or not, but I found that many Indian people had compassion, they have empathy for animals, and it was quite easy to get into conversations about veganism, vegetarianism, and animal rights with many people because they actually did care about animals. This guy's a great example of that. It's a nice question. Let's see what Dr. Sakir has to say in response to the question. But the Mahesh Kumar has asked a very good question. He said that in Islam, you all have non-veg food, you all kill animals, why does Islam give permission to kill living creatures? And can a Muslim be a pure vegetarian? Brother, before I answer the question, I'd like to tell you, a Muslim can be a very good Muslim even by being a pure vegetarian. It is not compulsory in Islam that you should have non veg food. It's not compulsory. There you go. That should be the end of the video, really. <laughs> if you're a Muslim, you can be vegetarian, you could be vegan, and it's not going to make you any kind of bad Muslim. That's a very clear message. I think that's a common sense, but it's good that this religious leader is saying it. If we analyze non-veg food, it's rich in protein. The human body, it requires 23 amino acids, out of which eight are not made in the human body. It should be given by external diet, which are known as essential amino acids. Now these all eight essential amino acids are present in no kind of vegetable food together. It's only present in flesh food. The non-veg flesh food is more nutritious as compared to vegetables. There is nothing more disappointing than seeing a supposed doctor standing up in front of thousands of people or millions of people when it's on YouTube and spreading dangerous misinformation like this. It's so wrong. It's so wrong. Everything he just said about plant foods and the protein content and protein quality of plant foods has been 100% debunked. Not last year, not the year before that, decades ago. Literally decades ago. All plants have protein and all plants have all of the essential amino acids that we need. But David, you're not a doctor. How can you say he's wrong? Okay, fair enough. Here's a video by Dr. Gregor to explain it. And all plant proteins have all essential amino acids. The only truly incomplete protein in the food supply is gelatin, which is uh, missing the amino acid tryptophan. Uh, so the only protein source that you couldn't live on is jello. Those eating plant-based diets average about twice the average requirement for protein. The concept that plant protein was inferior to animal protein arose from studies performed on rodents more than a century ago. Scientists found that infant rats don't grow as well on plants, but infant rats don't grow as well on human breast milk either. So does that mean we shouldn't breastfeed our babies? Ridiculous, they're rats. Rat milk has 
10 times more protein than human milk, because rats grow about 10 times faster than human infants. The myth that plant proteins are incomplete, that plant proteins aren't as good, that one has to combine proteins at meals, these have all been dismissed by the nutrition community as myths decades ago. But many in medicine evidently didn't get the memo. Dr. John McDougall called out the American Heart Association for a 2001 publication that questioned the completeness of plant proteins. Thankfully, though, they changed and acknowledged now that plant proteins can provide all the essential amino acids, no need to combine complementary proteins. It turns out our body is not stupid. It maintains pools of free amino acids that can be used to do all the complementing for us, not to mention the massive protein recycling program our body has. Some 90 grams of protein is dumped into the digestive tract every day from our own body to get broken back down and reassembled, so our body can mix and match amino acids to whatever proportions we need, whatever we eat making it practically impossible to even design a diet of whole plant foods that's sufficient in calories but deficient in protein. Plant-based consumers do not need to be at all concerned about amino acid imbalances from the plant proteins that make up our usual diets. Dr. Sakir should really stop spreading this dangerous misinformation to his millions of followers that leads them to continue abusing animals, like thinking they have to continue abusing animals. If he's really peaceful and really cares about those people, he'll stop encouraging them to abuse animals and stop lying to them about their nutrition. Furthermore, if you analyze, if you see the set of teeth of the herbivorous animals, the cow, the goat, the sheep, they have got flat set of teeth. They only have vegetables, they don't have flesh food. If we analyze the set of teeth of the carnivorous animals, the tiger, the leopard, the lion, they have got pointed set of teeth. They have canine set of teeth. They only have flesh, they don't touch vegetables. If you analyze the set of teeth of the human beings, if you go in the mirror and see, we human beings, we have got flat teeth as well as pointed teeth. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did he give us this canine teeth? Why did he give us this pointed teeth? For what? But natural to have non-veg food, to have the flesh food. The logic he's giving here is just so simplistic and childlike. It's just not what you expect from a doctor, let alone a famous spiritual leader who's giving information and like trying to lead people. It's just so, so disappointing to hear him saying this absolute nonsense. The animals with the largest canine teeth on earth, it's not a tiger, it's not a lion, it's not a leopard, it's the hippo. The hippopotamus. You know those giant hunters? Oh, oh no, wait, no. They're completely 100% herbivorous, plant-eating animals. They have the largest canines on Earth. By Dr. Zakir's logic, they should be the biggest meat eaters on Earth because they have the biggest canines, right? No, of course not. That's not how it works. There aren't others though, right? This is the only example. No, there are others. Fruit bats. Camels have canines, believe it or not. And musk deer is another example of a herbivore that has canine teeth. Correlation is not the same as causation, and as a doctor, Dr. Zakir should know the difference. Correlation would say that, well, most carnivorous animals have canine teeth. Causation would say that, therefore, to have canine teeth means you're a carnivorous animal or that you eat meat. But that's not how it works. Yes, there is a correlation, but there isn't a causation as proven by the hippopotamus. It's not true that the presence of canine teeth means that the canine teeth are designed to rip into flesh. And you can prove this by taking a look at other animals that have canine teeth designed to rip into flesh and compare them to your canine teeth, and you'll see there's a very big difference. There are different types of canine teeth for different purposes. Canine teeth are not all for ripping into animal flesh. Furthermore, if you analyze the digestive system of the human being, if you compare it to the herbivorous animals, cow, goat, sheep, they can only digest vegetables. The digestive system of the carnivorous animals, tiger, leopard, lion, they can only digest flesh food, they cannot digest vegetables. The digestive system of the human beings can digest both. It has small intestine, big intestine. It can digest vegetables as well as flesh food. It can digest both. So if Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did he give us the digestive system that can digest both? Right, there are two things to consider here. Firstly, the argument that he's giving us here is basically, if we can eat animals, but we shouldn't eat animals, then why did God give us the ability to eat animals? That's the argument he's putting forward. To make that in a more general sense, if we can do it, but we shouldn't do it, why did God give us the ability to do it? 
Again, it's a pathetic, childlike logic that you don't expect from a doctor or some kind of, you know, advanced spiritual leader as he's claiming himself to be. Because when you apply this to other scenarios, it really doesn't look so good. If we can rape, but we shouldn't rape, why did God give us the ability to rape? If we can murder, but we shouldn't murder, why did God give us the ability to murder? Having the ability to do something doesn't automatically justify doing that thing. This is common sense. Sure, you have the ability to be violent. You could abuse animals to eat their flesh, take their milk and their eggs and whatever else you want to take from them. But that doesn't mean you should and it doesn't mean you're justified in doing so. The second thing to consider, how well can you actually digest animal products? The consumption of animal products has been linked to the three biggest killers on the planet, cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. These three killers aren't linked to plant-only diets. Go to your nearest hospital. You won't see it full of vegans dying from diet-related illnesses. You'll see loads of people dying from diet-related illnesses related to the consumption of animal products. Brother, do you know that even plants have got life. Do you know that, brother? Yes. So if you say killing living creatures is a sin, killing a plant is also a sin. So why do you have plants? Agreed. Agreed. Very good. Oh, that... Jesus. That was horrible. So he's gone down the plants feel pain, plant lives matter route. Mm, it's like, I don't know, it's like, I feel like I've seen that somewhere else before. So whether you eat a plant or an animal or whatever, it is still violence. Of course, you also kill plants. Now, we can say plants are also life forms. It's almost like these religious leaders and pseudo-intellectuals follow the same path and come up with the same crap. They're just clutching at straws at any possible excuse they can give. The worst part about this segment of the video is that poor, compassionate guy who's now forced, has been bullied into saying, I agree because he, he, you know, doesn't have the, the ability to argue back, so he's just like, I agree. And you see that smirk on Dr. Zakir's face? You see how happy he is when he realizes that he's won this guy, that this guy's given in? He's clearly getting an immense satisfaction from this guy, like, giving in to him, and it's, it's just you, really. There are some people who say, okay, okay, brother Zakir, I agree that plants have got life, but the plants can't feel pain. Therefore, killing a plant, is a lesser sin as compared to killing animals. The point to be noted is that today science has advanced and we have come to know even the plants can feel pain. But the cry of the plant cannot be heard by the human being because human beings hear the frequency that they hear is from 20 cycles per second to 20,000 cycles per second. Anything below and above this range you cannot hear. So there's a farmer in America who converted the cry of the plant into the human frequency and you could come to know when the plants were crying, when they wanted water. Hmm, this pseudoscientific bullshit about plants screaming that we just, that we can't hear them sounds really familiar. Where did I hear that before? Plants are as sensitive as any other creature. Only thing is they don't scream. They do scream, you don't hear, that's all. Okay, let's deal with this. Plants can't scream. Plants don't have vocal cords, okay? They cannot scream. They don't have a central nervous system. They don't have consciousness. They don't have sentience. There have been some highly debated and highly speculative studies that said they release some kind of sound from water molecules in their cells, uh, popping or something like this. This has been something that has been studied, but it's been highly, highly debated, and people are very much speculative about what they did or didn't discover in these tests. So it's not conclusive, but what is conclusive is that they don't have vocal cords, so they can't scream. They are non-sentient life forms. They respond to stimuli at a chemical level only. But let's pretend for a minute that I agree. Let's pretend everything he said is correct. Let let's even go a step further. Let's say plants are even more sentient than that. Okay, let's, let's imagine we're in a world where all of this is true. Animals that are being bred for meat, dairy, and all the other things that they're being used for, what are they eating? Plants. And how many of them are there? There are around 60 billion of them being used and killed every year. And how many plants do they eat? Significantly more than humans ever could. Specifically, significantly more than 8 billion vegans ever could. So if you really are a Plant Lives Matter activist, you really do care about plants, go vegan because you're killing less plants and you're not going to be killing animals. So that is the best way to live if you want to avoid the suffering of plants and animals. Another person who came and argued with me and told me, Brother Zakir, I agree with you that plants have got life, plants can feel pain, but the plants 
have got about two senses less as compared to the animals. Therefore, killing a plant is a lesser sin as compared to killing an animal. I'm asking you the question, brother. Suppose your brother, your elder brother, he is born deaf and dumb. After he grows up and someone comes and kills him, so will you go and tell the judge, me Lord, give the murderer less punishment because my brother had two senses less. He could not hear, he could not speak. Will you say that? In fact, you will say, give the murderer double punishment. He could not hear, he could not speak. My brother was masoom. He was innocent. This is so ridiculous that you can use his exact point against him. This is how, how much of a stupid point this is, how much of a stupid example this is. Say if your brother was born with lower intelligence and somebody took your brother and used him, abused him, and then killed him because it was easy because of his low intelligence, would you want the judge to be harsh on that person? Or would you want the judge to let them go with a, a lesser punishment. No, you'd want them to be harsh on that person, correct? Well, that's what you're doing to the animals. The animals are less intelligent than you, and that's why you're abusing them and using them for all the different things that you're doing to them. So using Zakir's own logic against him, you should be vegan. If you are trying to save the plants, then veganism is the choice. And if you have a problem with saying someone has less senses, therefore deserves more protection, well, the animals have less intelligence. So by the same logic, they also deserve more protection. That means you need to stop harming them. I personally have got no problem if the non-Muslim don't have non-veg. I've got no problem. Only if they tell me eating non-veg is a sin, it's a crime, that's the time I give the reply. Otherwise, if the non-Muslims in India, they don't have non-veg, it's beneficial for me. If all the non-Muslims in India start having non-veg, then the prices of mutton and beef will rise. It'll be more expensive for me to have it. So personally, I've got no problem. Hope that satisfies your question, brother. Yeah, definitely, sir. Finally, we get to the real reason he's arguing so passionately in favor of continuing to abuse animals. He's got a problem with non-Muslims telling him it's wrong. It's a personal thing. It has nothing to do with logic. It has nothing to do with science. It has everything to do with his personal vendetta against people who aren't Muslim trying to tell him that abusing animals is wrong. Whenever you see someone standing up on a stage in front of a lot of people trying to defend abusing animals with a load of absolute bullshit and nonsense, irrational, logical argumentation like Dr. Zakir is doing right here, you can guarantee it is always down to the personal issues that they have. It is always down to the fact that they just don't want to change and it has nothing to do with reality, objectivity and education. It has nothing to do with that. Some of the most famous academics out there fall to pieces when the topic of veganism comes to light. These irrational, pathetic excuses are all down to one simple fact. They don't want to change. They know it's right, they know it's right for sure, but they don't want to change. So now, if you want, you can yet be a good vegetarian. If you want, you can eat non-veg also. Eating non-veg will keep you more healthy, but even if you want to be a pure vegetarian, it's not a sin. Hope that answers the question, brother. Oh yeah, totally. Eating non-veg will keep you healthy. That's why if you go to any hospital and ask the doctors, what are the most people in here for? and what diet is it related to, they're definitely gonna tell you it's all the vegans that are there in the beds dying, right? Hmm, yeah, for sure. It's gonna be the non-vegans, it's gonna be the meat eaters, it's gonna be the animal products causing the diseases, the diet-related diseases, it's always, always the animal products that are causing it. Go and ask any doctor, go and walk into any hospital and you'll see. Three biggest killers, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer are directly linked to the consumption of animal products. Dr. Zakir is just another meat flake who doesn't want to give up eating animal products or has generated loads of pseudo-scientific, illogical arguments to try and justify his animal abusive habits. There are plenty of people making the exact same excuses as him, like Sadhguru, Eckhart Tolle. There are Buddhist leaders, Hindu leaders, Christian leaders, even atheist leaders making this same bullshit excuse excuses as him. And they're all making the same bullshit excuses because in reality this has nothing to do with spirituality, religion, or even logic. It has everything to do with these people knowing deep down that it is the right thing to do to change and be better for the animals. But it's just down to the fact that they don't want to. So they create all this nonsense to try and make themselves feel better. If you're watching this as a Muslim, what else do you need to go vegan, really? Dr. Zakir says it's not a sin, and now you know you can get all the nutrition that you need from the plant-based diet. Don't make lame excuses like Dr. Zakir. Be better. Stand against animal abuse. Go vegan. 
If you'd like to see a more in-depth discussion on veganism and Islam and how they can connect and be compatible, do check out this video. It's a live stream that I did with Altab Hossein, who is a vegan activist who also happens to be a Muslim. We got into some very intricate conversations about Islam and veganism, so do make sure to check that out. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.